Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another Learning Lunch hosted by FormatApproved.com. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Education with FormEd Training, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's Learning Lunch will cover secure HIPAA-compliant messaging in the healthcare environment. We are joined today by Baxter Webb of MedArcon, a leading provider of HIPAA-compliant messaging. Baxter has a wealth of experience in healthcare, which you can see on the slide, and we're pleased to share his expertise with you today. I think we're going to learn a lot about HIPAA-compliant messaging today. Please note that you can ask questions of your presenter at any time today during this session by entering them into the chat area. In the second half of our session, we will address as many questions as time allows. If we do run out of time, answers to all submitted questions will be posted to our website and sent via email link later in the week. Also, note that all registered attendees of today's session will receive an email with links to both the recorded and PDF versions of the event. So people often ask us during the webinar if they can get the slides, and rest assured we'll send those out to you after the event. Well, Baxter, first of all, thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure, Brian. All right. Well, I think this is an exciting topic, especially with uh, you know the September 23rd deadline. There's a lot of interest in HIPAA right now, and a lot of questions around this sort of technology. So it's a real pleasure to be able to share your expertise with people. Oh no, it's great. We uh, it is it, it is an exciting time. Uh, I think for HIPAA compliant messaging, um, I think there's a lot of value that can bring uh, across a lot of different spectrums. So uh, very happy to to discuss the topic today. All right. Well, great. Let's begin then. So why should an organization care about HIPAA-compliant text messaging? Yeah, so I think the reality of this situation is that doctors are texting each other right now. Um, there have been some studies that have found that 70% of physicians um, and nurses are texting, um, even despite organizational policies not to. Um, and we've, we've talked to a lot of CIOs, a lot of chief information security officers, um, you know, and, and in those conversations we often hear, well, we have a, a organizational policy to do not text, um, do not use your mobile phone, um, and, and they will kind of wink and smile and, and acknowledge the fact that it's, it's just not really a realistic policy, and that's, um, that's kind of really the case that, 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 that we're seeing. I think it's um, certainly bearing out um, with kind of the use uh, uh, that, that, that's happening now. So um, we certainly have seen Office of Civil Rights um, stepping up its enforcement actions over the past five to six years, um, becoming very aggressive um, around this. There haven't been any public violations um, regarding cell phones that, that we've seen at least, um, at least no really big newsworthy ones, although we are aware of organizations that have had um, breaches uh, through cell phones and specifically through text messaging. Um, and there was an interesting study that found that over 50% um, of HIPAA breaches are, are now happening from kind of what we call mobile or untethered devices. Um, so we think that organizations need to become more sophisticated about this, become proactive about it, um, give their providers a solution that they're, they want to use that has good usability um, while ensuring that they remain HIPAA compliant and lowering their OCR fine risk. Absolutely. I, I think it would be a huge mistake for organizations to be complacent about this because it's just it seems to be a ripe example that OCR is going to go in and make an example out of somebody who is not meeting their obligations on this stuff. That's right. I think, I, I think it's really just a matter of time um, mm -hmm. before we see uh, somebody unfortunately get um, kind of an enforcement action from the OCR. I, I think that's true. So what are some important security questions that people need to ask when they're thinking about uh, adopting a HIPAA-compliant text messaging solution? Absolutely. So there, there are kind of two classes of products um, in terms of architectures that exist within the HIPAA-compliant space. Um, there's one form of architecture that actually has data downloaded to the local device, um, and then they try to encrypt that on the local drive. Um, so when you have those type of solutions, you need to understand that the data is persisting on those phones. You need to be able to have the ability to remotely wipe um, and, and have other kind of administrative controls, more of a, a full MDM um, kind of solution that, that can handle all of that. Um, the other class of products uh, stream data on the fly to the local devices, but they don't allow the data to persist on the local drive. So as soon as the session's gone, all of the files are flushed. 
Um, and, and you know, I think both are very valid solutions. I think both get you to um, you know NIST compliance and HIPAA compliance, and um, you know, I think both both are good solutions. But you need to understand how how it works, um, and then what other kind of safeguards you need to take as, as an organization, either through policies or other MDN type solutions that you need to implement um, to make sure that your data is fully secure when you have a mobile uh, messaging solution in place. Um, we think it's also important to know, you know, how the system authenticates users. Um, you know, how many factors is it using? Is you know, there's some sophistication around the, the level of authentication that's required. Um, can it integrate with your existing systems for authentication? So you're not requiring users to have a, a, a new username or password or maintaining data in two places. Um, we think that's important. Uh, I think it's also important to think about, you know, how much data is this system actually keeping um, both on the local device but also you know on, on the servers that are either in the cloud or hosted locally um, you know and just how much how much PHI is being stored in there is it are there solutions out there that can actually reduce the amount of PHI that has to be stored um, and can rely more on integrations to empower that um, you know I think that that's something that's that's an important thing to think about as well um, Always good to ask about encryption. Um, I wouldn't look at anything with less than 128-bit uh, SSL. Um, I think you want to have your your backend databases either in the cloud or, or, or locally hosted. Um, you know, ha have some kind of encryption around that. Um, and then it's also important from a HIPAA standpoint to understand how the system logs events. So, who's logging in? Who's looking at patient information? Um, you know, is there a HIPAA audit trail that's being um, continued across in this in this method as well um, and what kind of audit capabilities do you have in general for the solution so you've talked about a little bit about some of the uh, features that people should look for in HIPAA compliant text messaging but what do they need to understand about how the messages are addressed yeah so, so what's interesting is you know HIPAA compliant text messaging you're, you're, you're starting to replace pagers at this point. Um, that's, that's kind of the use case that you're getting into here. And when you start to do that, I think you need to understand some of the fundamental problems that exist in paging. And, and if you're going to do HIPAA compliant messaging reliably um, while trying to focus on ensuring good quality of care for patients, uh, there's some really important use cases you need to consider. Um, there was a great study that was done in 2010 that found one in seven pages was actually sent to the wrong individual. Um, that can create a headache for the person who gets paged, especially if it's the middle of the night or gets a HIPAA compliant message sent to them. Um, and, and more so, it can lead to breakdowns in communication, breakdowns in care, delay in care. Uh, so we think it's important for a solution to help the sender of that message uh, identify the most appropriate person on the care team um, to send that message to. Now, a lot of times the user will know this, but it certainly seems that they're at least um, Enough, enough of an incidence of times where they don't know the appropriate person to contact that this kind of feature is supported. Um, we also think it's important that um, messages have meaningful priorities uh, attached to them um, in terms of addressing. Uh, so, uh, not not all messages are you know just standard priority. Um, and we even think that even just a two-tiered system for message priority is probably not adequate. So something that can help the, the user identify what the priority of the message should be so that you don't have alert fatigue, so that you make sure issues are handled appropriately. Um, and then the, the last piece is, you know, can this integrate with your call scheduling system or other solutions you have um, so that you don't, again, have, you know, you're respecting the authoritative source for data and don't have to have um, uh, really disparate systems for this. So that's the addressing of the messages. What do people need to think about in terms of delivering the message? Yeah, so uh, again, there's some kind of interesting literature um, in a peer-reviewed journal article that found that 30% of pages go unanswered um, within 15 minutes of being sent. And again, this is, you know, now that we're kind of thinking about this as a solution for delivering important messages, how can this make sure that these messages are acted upon? Um, so I think there, there's some good solutions that are out there that, that allow escalation of messages, tracking of messages, um, acceptance of messages perhaps. Um, so I think you want to think about you know, ha what does this system do to ensure 
that when a message comes across, um, that the person receiving it um, has context and understands how important the message is, um, and is then able to handle that issue in an appropriate amount of time. Um, some solutions allow a user to actually accept or decline a message. Um, I think you have to think about what is appropriate there. Um, you know, if somebody really has duty um, to a patient, is it is it really medical medical legally sound for them to be able to decline that um, in real time? I think that some maybe some of the use cases that some of the solutions have don't really understand healthcare. Um, so you have to think about under, under what circumstances is, is that acceptable in our organization? Do we want to to have that actually be able to happen? Um, and again, the escalation algorithms are important. Um, and, and, and just for delivery as well, I think you want to look at the architecture and understand, you know, what does this have to make sure that there's high availability, redundancy, backup, um, things of that nature, so that the system which can have critical messages going across um, is always available um, to people within your, your organization. So it's interesting, you know, people are relying on this technology more and more, and yet we, you're giving us a nice survey of some of the issues involved. It is not surprising to me at all that one out of seven messages gets sent to the wrong person, unfortunately, or that pages are, you know, often ignored, even though they're, you know, critical to care in some cases. So um, I think it's food for thought for people that if they are going to use this technology, they need to look at better solutions. I think that's right. I mean, uh, you know, you can implement a, a, a secure messaging solution, um, and if it doesn't have good usability, there are going to be workarounds. And so I think you have to think through the usability that's going to be meaningful for your organization, meaningful for your providers. Um, try to go with a solution that is going to make sure that they use the system and that you can really leverage value from um, the, the workflows and data that's coming out of that system. Um, to enable outcomes that are important, um, so patient care outcomes, financial outcomes. Um, there, there are things of that nature that I think, um, you know, if you get a really robust solution, um, can really help your organization not just be HIPAA compliant, but really take what you're doing to the next level, ensure good quality of care, ensure um, financial return for your organization. Yeah, that's interesting. It's like HIPAA compliance is sort of the bare bones. It must be HIPAA compliant, but then that's how right. can you take it and, and make it into a solution that really adds value? That's right. Yep. And, you know, we, we had an interesting conversation early on with Neil Patel, the Chief Medical Information Officer for Vanderbilt. And it wasn't a matter of him you know, being able to find a HIPAA compliant solution. It was him finding a HIPAA compliant solution that their doctors and nurses would actually use. Um, because if, if, if not using it, it's not HIPAA compliant. Um, and if right. you can't get extra value out of it, uh, you have issues there. All right, well, let's move on then. So here's a, a kind of an interesting question. You've got this secure system. Should your HIPAA compliant text messaging solution allow users to text clinicians outside of the system? So this is, this is a question that we get a lot. And I think that um, a lot of institutions um, struggle with this question. I think that especially the people that are in kind of an information security or um, CIO type role um, worry about the security aspects of that. So once, you know, there, there's some solutions that, you know, have a website that you can go to to authenticate and view these messages if you're not an active user or outside the system. And that's, that's a nice feature, but you can sometimes lose control um, of the message and the content at that point. Um, so it's, from a security standpoint, it can be a little bit difficult. Um, you know, doctors, we've heard that sometimes they like to get these curbside consults. What's interesting is um, the, the medicine behind it, it suggests that it's actually not a good practice for patients. Um, so there's a really interesting study that was um, published earlier this year where the hospital system looked at patient, doctors that actually saw the uh, patients in person and then doctors that um, were asked to provide a curbside consult, so, you know, a remote consult with information being given. 51% um, of the time they found that the information being given to the doctor given a curbside consult was incomplete or inaccurate. Um, and then, interestingly, 60% of the time the doctor giving a curbside consult um, gave advice that was different from the doctor that actually saw the patient. So in terms of quality of care, ensuring that your patients in your institution are getting um, really the best level of care and appropriate care. Um, we think that there are some maybe patient safety issues and or quality of care issues with allowing these curbside consults. Um, you know, and I think the other, other 
really big piece that we encourage people to think about is, you know, what's what's the financial model for this to you? So if we open this up to doctors and or you know nurses or other people in your system, and they're getting you know pinged by people outside your organization, a it can increase liability for them um, because there, there is a legal precedent that they can be included in lawsuits when things go wrong for that patient, and there's no revenue for them. So their their time is being taken up to providing a consult. They're incurring medical legal risk, but there's no additional reimbursement to them for doing that. So it's just a model that. that we kind of encourage people to think through. Um, I think, you know, there 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 are solutions that enable this, um, but again, we we urge some caution around this. So, is it safe to say that in most circumstances, you would urge providers to avoid um, doing this, even if they're able to, uh, because of the complications you're discussing now? Yes, we think that it's it's a high risk, low benefit, um, a prop, you know function to have. Um, we think there's very little upside for the hospital and the doctors and the patient um, by doing this. So we, we, we do strongly urge them not to, to use this type of feature. So before we proceed, I just want to remind our audience that we are going to save time at the end for questions. Uh, you can go ahead and ask those questions at any time by entering them into the chat area. We'll save them for the end and then we'll share them with our experts. So please feel free to go ahead and ask those questions or you can ask them at the end. But let's move on. So what are some other features people need to think about uh, for when they're considering which messaging solution they should adopt? Yeah, so I think we believe in patient-centric messaging. And so that means that the patient is um, the center of all the messages within uh, the system that we use. And there are other solutions that do this too. Um, and then there are other solutions that just have kind of it, it, it's more like a traditional inbox with you know messages going back and forth to and from people, but we don't have it tied directly to a specific patient. Um, we think that's important. Twenty percent of pages fail to identify the patient, and from a quality of care standpoint, um, that can lead to poor outcomes. So if there's confusion about who the patient is, um, if you're not able to pull that data back into the patient's medical record, um, create HIPAA audit logs for that patient. Um, there, there are a number of reasons that, that we encourage people to think about patient-centric messaging and, and really trying to optimize on that. We also encourage people to think about the value of the data that's going back and forth across the system. Um, communication breakdown is responsible for 60 to 70 percent of the uh, fatal medical errors that happen in the United States each year. So there are 200,000 preventable deaths is the equivalent of a 747 airplane crashing every single day. Um, and with communication playing such a large role in that, are there analytics that can be layered on top of the communication flow to try to prevent those? Um, can you provide QI, QA type um, initiatives and data um, to help people improve their internal communication processes? Um, are, are there ways that the data can be leveraged to um, make a more complete uh, legal medical record? Um, and that gets into the documentation. So how, how does this feed back into the electronic medical record? You, you, again, you know, I think having an authoritative source for patient information is important, and it's not good to have disparate systems here. So you know, can this information be pushed back into the electronic medical record? Can it be consolidated in a meaningful way that everybody on the care team um, you know, now and in the future can understand what these communications were um, and, and really use and leverage that knowledge to provide better patient care. Um, it's also important to think about the backup and data recovery plan um, that a solution has. So we, we kind of alluded to this earlier, but you know, if things go down, um, certainly cloud-type environments are, um, have some benefits associated with, uh, in terms of data recovery and backup and high availability. Um, regardless, though, you need to understand kind of where is this data being backed up how quickly can we recover our data if something happens, and you know, and what's what's kind of the disaster plan um, around trying to get the system back up and operational if something were to happen. So this is an interesting question because I'm confident this is one that a lot of people have never thought about. But so tell us a little bit about how FDA regulation of mobile health will affect products in this space. Absolutely. So. Um, you know, the, the, the current kind of, uh, or, or the current guidance or kind of current opinion, I guess, on, on what the FDA will do here is that 
if, if a solution, a mobile health solution, interfaces with an other FDA-regulated device, um, then it will be regulated. We'll obviously learn a lot more towards the end of this year when the final guidance is released. Um, but in all the conversations that I've had with kind of industry leaders and experts here, that's my understanding. Um, the importance of that is that certain texting solutions that are on the market interface with telemetry devices, lab reporting systems, um, and they're trying to pull that information out and provide it in real time, sending alerts um, from certain types of, of these devices. Um, those are all going to be potentially FDA regulated if the kind of current opinion on guidance comes to fruition. Um, and that's going to have some pretty significant uh, implications for those products. So um, I've taken a product through the 510K to Novo pathway before. Um, with these types of new devices that are newly regulated by the FDA, um, the, there is no mandated timeline for how the FDA has to handle those applications. And they can potentially block um, either those features or the entire product um, from being used during the regulatory process um, unless like a pre-PMA or other type of pre-market um, approval procedure is used. Um, and if you're going to be FDA regulated, you really need to be proactive um, about how you design your system. So the, the FDA requires for these type of systems, it's almost a very waterfall type approach where you define very early on before you even start coding your, your product, you know, how are we going to test this thing? What are the requirements that we have? Um, you know, what are the, you know, how, how are we going to create policies? What are the policies around this? It, it's a very laborious, expensive process, um, but you have to have it. And that's, that's the quality systems regulation guidance from the FDA. Um, and then once you, you know, as part of the testing product process, you have to go through a hazard risk analysis and do usability studies. So, you know, are, are these solutions that do this, how, how are they trying to mitigate the risk potentially around this? Um, and, and the biggest question I think is, you know, for these solutions that are doing this, how are you insulating the non-FDA regulated part of your device from the FDA regulated uh, part? Um, you need very specific counsel around this and, and, and how you can ensure that, you know, just the, the, the basic messaging functionality um, doesn't, it, it's carved off enough from the part that's going to be FDA regulated so that you don't get a cease and desist letter from the FDA or don't have to go through PMA um, in order to get regula uh, regulatory approval and usage. Well, I'm sure that we'll address some of the FDA uh, issues in the question and answer session. It seems like there's a lot we could cover there. Um, really interesting problem <laughs> that people are going to be facing. So let's get down to brass tacks then. How much is a HIPAA compliant text messaging? How much is that going to cost an organization? What should people expect? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So I think um, that there are a couple applications on the market that kind of advertise themselves as free. Um, and if you go and, and, and get one of those, you're going to quickly find out to have anything that's meaningful in terms of a product, you have to start paying them. It's kind of like you can, you can download a demo product, but if you actually want to be able to use it in your organization, you actually have to start paying for it. Um, so we've kind of heard some interesting uh, pushback or uh, from people that uh, kind of feel a little bit missed um, because of maybe some false advertising or just, just not, not really the best kind of practices there. So most solutions, or at least all solutions that we know about, um, are going to charge you something. Again, there are two different models here. So there are hosted solutions that, are in, that live in the cloud, um, and they kind of have a software as a service model type pricing. Uh, it used to be that you could talk Tiger Text down to $3 per user per month. Um, I, I've heard that that's maybe trending upwards a little bit. Um, there's some solutions that cost over $100 per position or per user per month. Um, and I, it, it, it's a little bit hard to understand how that's justified, um, especially in relation to what's kind of being paid for paging and the, and the value that it's providing. But there are some solutions out there that are charging pretty high amounts. Um, the other model is an on-prem installation. Um, and I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens in the next next few years now that Amazon is, is willing to sign BA agreements. and. Um, you know, it, it certainly has seemed in the past that most institutions are a little bit hesitant about having their solutions um, posted in the cloud. Um, and so these on-prem institutions act more like a, uh, a, a traditional software um, installation with a license fee um, followed by an SLA. Um, and so you're talking, you know, uh, we've seen anywhere from about 200 to 250 
sometimes more, sometimes less, but that's, that's kind of the median pricing that we've seen uh, around this per user, and then you're going to have, a, obviously, a maintenance fee based on the SLA um, for that. So those are the sort of the, what to call those, the sticker prices, I guess. What, but obviously That's there's correct. a lot of other uh, issues involved that people need to think through. What do they need to think about in terms of the time and resource commitment required to actually adopt one of these solutions and get it running properly? That's right. Yeah, so I think um, it obviously depends on how big your practice is. It depends on how many systems, IT systems you have in place, what kind of integrations have to be built, um, the number of resources you have internally available. Um, you know, I, I think that for, for larger hospital organizations, um, by the time the contract is executed to the time that it's actually up in system-wide adoption, it's, it's about six months. Um, certainly for smaller physician practices or even moderate-sized physician practices, that time's uh, shorter. For really large hospital systems, it, it, it gets a little bit more complicated, and, and you can look at 12-month you know, plus for rollout. Um, in terms of the resources, so with uh, on-prem installations, you're obviously going to have to either cluster or set up virtual machines or go purchase um, new, new hardware um, for, for some of these on-prem solutions. Um, regardless, you'll be building integrations most likely, at least from the EMR um, for most solutions. Um, maybe Active Directory, other types of uh, single sign-on providers. Um, so you're going to have some kind of, depending on whether you want the vendor to manage that or you want to manage that internally, um, you know, you at least need to have a governance council, um, an integration team that can help guide that process and, and give access, um, and maybe in some cases they're actually doing the heavy lifting. Um, we, we, as part of our onboarding process, we like to identify power users um, and have them kind of be product champions and, and then take this out to other colleagues and help train other colleagues. We think that's just a really great way to um, Get, get actual users up and running, um, and then get early feedback on how it needs to be customized um, to each institution. All right, and then this may be the most important question of all, uh, at least to some folks. What kind of ROI, return on investment, can they expect from such a solution? Yeah, and so, uh, you know, I, I think that, that, that the... Um, demonstrable ROI that's been improved to date is, is non-existent. Um, we've seen, you know, I think a lot of people will put out information on user satisfaction. That's kind of a very soft um, type of ROI, um, but you'll see, you'll see everybody talk about, about that. Um, we've seen some kind of case, individual case studies done that are, talk about care coordination. Um, but again, it's not a systematic type study. It's um, a little bit fuzzy in terms of uh, uh, of the actual ROI there. Um, a lot of times it's more qualitative in point, not hard ROI measures. Um, we're starting to see a little bit around provider efficiency. Now it's not directly tied to um, either revenue increases or cost decreases, um, but you are seeing some vendors discuss about how they're saving some time or at least could save time um, around the process of paging. Um, we really think what's meaningful is to actually do um, a, hard, 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 uh, excuse me, a hard ROI analysis. And you need to, through a clinical study, look at when you put this type of system in place, you know, is it moving the needle around medical errors? Um, are you perhaps increasing HCAP scores through better coordinated care? Um, can you show a meaningful impact on quality measures? Um, can you actually demonstrate that revenues or expenses are changing for an organization based on use of this? Um, so I think that's the kind of sophistication that healthcare customers um, are looking for now, and I think it's what they deserve, and, and um, so we think it's important to get that to them. So on the one hand, you're talking about the soft data, and you know, part of this is that people, this is kind of to me the foundation, if people want to be using text messaging, if they're going to be using it, giving them a solution that they can actually use, that's, that's kind of the fundamentals that they, you've got to do that or you're not doing anything. And, and I guess the customer right. satisfaction would sort of measure that, but it really wouldn't get into any of these other issues that you're discussing. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I think this is getting back to the, the value that this type of system can have for your organization. You know, obviously there's, there's value around giving your doctors and nurses a tool that they want to use. There's value in, in protecting yourself from kind of HIPAA, OCR risk. Um, but there's 
uh, I think that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg uh, behind the value that this that these type of systems can have. Um, and especially with accountable care coming with some of the changing reimbursement um, kind of landscape that we're seeing, the in increased pressure on margins for hospitals and physician practices, I, you know, I, I think that you have to start to think through what, what can this system really do to help me as an organization thrive under the changing uh, healthcare paradigm. All right. Well, we have plenty of time for questions and answers, so I want to uh, invite our guests to ask questions. Um, we've already got a couple in, but we've got plenty of time, so please feel free to ask those. This is a rare opportunity, uh, if you have any questions around HIPAA-compliant text messaging, to sort of pick the brain of our expert and really um, feel free to ask any question you may be having. So let's start with the first question, Baxter, if we could. And I love this because it's something that other people may have thought and not asked, <laughs> so it's good to address it. It's simple. Why can't people just use regular text messaging? Any, you know, to yeah. yeah, so that's a great question. Yeah. So SMS text messaging, there are a couple of issues there. Um, one, it's not most of the time it's not sent via an SSL type connection. Um, two, that that data persists uh, kind of unencrypted on the local device. Um, so if a, a self smartphone goes missing or a laptop goes missing. Um, anybody can, if you're able to log into the phone, the whatever PIN system there is, um, you can get access to that data. It's not encrypted. It's not stored. Um, the biggest issue, though, is that it's not sent uh, kind of across the wire um, encrypted. So somebody can, you know, potentially, again, it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a far out there use case or, or, or scenario, but somebody could potentially be monitoring bandwidth and intercepting um, signal that they come across, and you could have compromise. I think the bigger issue, though, is that this data is sticking around on the local device. If a smartphone goes missing, if a, uh, a tablet goes missing and these messages um, are on there, you have to worry about that. Even if it doesn't get you know, technically breached, you have to notify a breach and there's potential damage and, and fine just, just because of that. So that, that's the biggest reason that, that we think SMS is not, not a, a valid um, solution. Yeah, so, you know, even when you were saying even if it's only technically a breach, even if no one actually views the messages or there's no evidence that anyone views the messages, if they're not properly secured, that in and of itself would be a breach. Um, is that correct. correct? And you still have to notify and it's not right. one process. So for folks who may not know, uh, you know, the High Tech Act is very specific about encryption and what are the rules around encryption. HIPAA doesn't require encryption exactly. That's correct. Yeah. But... If you know, if you lose a device and the data and it has PHI on it and that PHI is not encrypted, that in itself is a breach, even if there's no evidence that anyone ever accesses it. That's correct. So, um, and one other thing, you mentioned that the messages persist on the device, which is an important point. Um, one of our HIPAA experts has noted in the past, another problem is that the messages um, persist with the carrier. And that they're they're never truly deleted. So you may delete all the messages on your phone, and then your device is okay. But uh, those messages that contain PHI that's protected by HIPAA are basically stored in perpetuity by the carrier, and there's no way for you to control that information. Yeah, and then and the bigger issue too is so there's another issue if they use Siri or another voice to text, like an Android voice to text, uh -huh. that's actually stored in the cloud, and Apple holds on to that. Wow. It's not just the carrier, so there, there, there are multiple ways that that data can get out there. Yeah, and you know, the new focus uh, around HIPAA, especially um, with the new uh, omnibus final rule, is really to look at this stuff very carefully. So uh, people definitely need to pay attention to these issues because, you know, they're going, they're saying now that, you know, if you have a cloud-based uh, storage uh, backup system, that those folks are business associates. They have to meet their HIPAA obligations. So they're really looking at digital and cloud-based technologies to ensure that they meet those HIPAA requirements. That's, that's right, yep. Yeah. And, and the, regu the regulation and enforcement is starting to kind of catch up with what, what's been happening. And so um, it, it's a very timely uh, thing to be thinking about this as an organization. All right, well, here's a question. I don't know if uh, this falls within... Uh, your usual area of expertise, but I'm going to ask it and see what you say. The question is about uh, e-faxing, 
and they're wondering if you know how much of this applies to e-faxing, faxing to email, emailing to fax. Should you know should they look for that sort of thing from a solution like this, or what could you say about that issue? Yeah, so I, all, most solutions in this space um, will allow you either directly or through a third party um, to send any kind of uh, file. Um, so you know we we can do audio, video, um, pictures, uh, text files. You know I think I think that. For, for care collaboration, you want to see the ability to do that because people do need to share that type of information back and forth. Um, you know, in the e-faxing aspect, you know, there's certainly, you know, with, with provider to provider being able to send documents, um, as long as it's being done encrypted and using the same technology, um, it can almost replace e-faxing. All right. Got another question here, which is about, I guess, platforms, you could say. Do these uh, solutions generally work with any device, or do they trend in one direction or another? Yeah, so um, a lot of people have developed for most of the big platforms that are out there. So, um, you know, Android and iOS, I think, are a must. You'll see some people that are also de de uh, developing for BlackBerry, um, and some people that are developing for Windows um, with the Windows uh, smartphone OS. Um, the the Data that I have seen on the penetration and uh, all the different operating systems uh, in healthcare, and specifically among doctors, um, the, I, the iOS is by far the largest. I think it has 70% penetration rate. So, for your doctors, you definitely want to make sure that, um, that that whatever solution it is has iOS. It is important to be across multiple, um, you know, especially for a BYOD type policy. You want to make sure that it can support the different operating systems that people within your institution have, um, and, and most of them are, you know, across multiple um, platforms. I love that uh, expression, BYOD. Is that is that something you see a lot of? Are there organizations where it's sort of show up with your phone and we'll handle it that way, or or are most organizations issuing devices to folks? So there there are some solutions out there that require the organization to go buy. Um, actually go buy devices for their doctors um, and nurses. So uh, there's one solution that, you know, you have to staff your entire nursing, um, you, have, you have to give your entire nursing staff um, an iPad touch um, with Wi-Fi connection. Uh, you know, my, in my discussions with organizations, I think that becomes cost prohibitive very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can securely, especially if you can keep data from persisting on the local device, um, then it's perfectly acceptable in a much more cost-effective manner um, to have a BYOD policy in place. And from a usability standpoint, it's good too. I mean, having to carry multiple devices is a pain. Um, and so if you can have these in place and allow BYOD, it makes it easier for your users. I think it makes it easier for you. Um, and there's a lot of value that's provided by that. So let's, I, I want to follow up with this issue of, you know, you said there's two kind of paths to this. One is that some solutions will have the message come and then it's encrypted on the device, and then other solutions will have, uh, there is no data stored on the device. Um, so for those where there is no data stored on the device, it's always a process of accessing the cloud and, and grabbing the data, or how does that work? Yeah, so you, um, you know, you can also have an on-prem with an, with an externally facing API that lives in like the DMZ. Uh, <laughs> so what happens is you have to have, uh, you have to have um, really some type of notification for how, you know, when a new message comes across the system so that the user knows to open up the application. And then when they open up the application, it forms a secure connection with that API. Um, so that data can be streamed on the fly, um, and it, it's basically like playing a video cast in real time um, of what's stored on the secured database. And so the API would typically come with the solution, or it should, it should absolutely, yeah. Okay, so part of... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that that's without that API in place, you know, it, it's a, it's a pretty sophisticated architecture you have to have in order to enable that. Um, real-time communications while having this, this type of model without data persisting. Um, it's pretty complicated. It requires a lot of newer technologies in order to do that. 
Um, but the, you know, the whole product should, you know, when, when you buy a solution, it should include the back-end database. It should include all of the software um, and local installs on, on smart, you know, the, the native iOS, Android, BlackBerry um, applications, as well as the kind of back-end um, server architecture um, and software to, to make, make the messages be able to go back and forth in real time um, without the data persisting. So just for folks who may not know, API uh, is basically a, a program that allows one application to talk to another. Um, so those are things that uh, when people are looking for these solutions, they may want to call in some of their um, IT expertise and make sure that they're going through all of the specifications to be sure it's going to meet the needs that they have. That's right. Well, here we have a, a great question. I love this one about... Uh, meaningful use um, and patient yes. portals. So yep. the question is for stage two of meaningful use, um, and and that you know patient portals are really uh, an important part of stage two. What That's issues right. are there if a patient accesses it via their phones? Yeah. So um, you know I think that the that, that, that's honestly uh, to be perfectly honest, that's not a, a, a area that we've really tackled. Um, I think that the patient portals, most of them are websites. So again, you're talking about temporary files. Um, without knowing a whole lot about the architecture of those, I, I would hope that the data is not persisting. Um, although I'm sure that in the agreements for those patient portals, there's um, some kind of legal clause that says if the patient causes a breach, they're responsible for it. Um, so I, you know, I think that you want to have. If I was thinking about patient portals, I, I would think through the same issues. Though, um, you know, how am I ensuring that patients can access this with while, while still trying to maintain the security of the system? Um, you know, how am I how am I tracking what's happening? How am I auditing this? Um, how am I taking what's you know coming out of the portal and incorporating that into the larger medical record? Um, I think most. EMR companies provide a pretty good interface for doing this, um, but again, I think that there's, you know, the, the, the value that we see is, you know, can you take statuses or requests or things that are coming out of the patient portal and provide that to the doctor in a meaningful way that doesn't cause alert and fatigue, uh, but helps them know that something has been updated within the patient portal or a new request has come in. So that's one of the, you know, I, I think that in terms of how secure messaging and patient portals interact, I think that's a really obvious kind of unity or inter intersection there. Yeah, that's interesting. So it might be a matter of, you know, there being an update or a message sent through the patient portal, and it's not so much that the patient portal itself um, is part of the messaging technology, but rather that it might inform the doctor. Um, there might be a follow-up step there informing them that they've got a message. That's correct. Yep. And, you know, the idea here is that these patient portals, I think part of the point is that they'll be um, more secure and HIPAA compliant, but I'm sure we've all had experience with folks out there who, you know, they, they saw that their EHR was quote-unquote HIPAA compliant and plugged it in and thought that they were HIPAA compliant, but, of course, it, <laughs> it doesn't work that way at all. Um, That's right. So there's a lot, I think there's going to be a lot of questions around, and this is why people are a little nervous about stage two, is that there's all of this new technology, and no one's completely sure how it's all going to hang together at this point. That's right. Yeah, and I, I, I do. I think there are a lot of interoperability challenges that are still left. I think that there are a lot of um, policy and organizational procedure challenges that, 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 that have to be met, and I certainly think patient portals is, is one of those areas where, um, you know, you have to get a little bit more... Um, thoughtful of how you, as an organization, can promote um, your, your patients and, and HIPAA compliance while having those solutions in place. So here's a question um, following up about the FDA issue. Um, the question is, how do we find out whether the solution interacts with FDA-regulated devices? So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about, you know, what people can ask of the provider in terms of and just review again the issues that people need to be aware of. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the question you want to ask is, what what clinical systems does this um, integrate with? And uh, you can be almost pretty sure that any time a 
uh, a solution is sending alerts um, of some kind from other clinical systems. Um, you know, if it's using like the Health Level 7 um, interoperability standard for alerts, I think that there's a good chance it's going to be FDA regulated. Um, so I, the, the questions I would ask is, you, you know, as part of your process is, you know, what, what does this integrate with? Where is it pulling data from? Um, I think it's important to, uh, you know, then figure out, okay, is this FDA regulated? Anything that's telemetry, most lab kind of reporting systems um, are, if it integrates, the, the EMR as of, as of now is not FDA regulated. There's some rumblings that might change. Um, so if data comes out of the EMR, it's okay. But if it's coming, um, you know, from from a alerting system, a you know, pulse ox or heart monitor or um, some other kind of system that's sending those alerts, that's where it's going to get FDA regulated, at least from what I've heard. Now this is interesting. So at least in theory, you know, you could have peripheral devices that are integrated with the EMR, and then if your messaging technology connects to the EMR, then you're okay from an FDA perspective. But if it connects that's directly the to the device, area. you're not. Yep, that's the gray area. Um, and, and so I think you have to be careful with the type of, you know, you have to think about upstream. Where where is this data even coming into the EMR? Um, you mm -hmm. know, and there's certain types of, you know. You're going to be safe with basic patient information, so diagnoses, um, you know, diff different, you know, medications, procedures, plan, things like that. You're fine pulling those kind of things in, but when you really start to get into, especially, I, I, I just would be very wary of any type of alert that's being pulled in, even if it's coming from the EMR, or you know, by by way of the EMR, um, I would be a little bit hesitant about it. All right. Well, interesting issues there. And, you know, this is a new subject for me, so I just want to ask one more question about it. So you seem to indicate, you know, that there's there's an expectation of rules to be issued around this question. There is. Um, the guy, I, I believe it's coming up sometime in December. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the, 100% sure of the exact date in December. Um, uh, but we'll, we'll know a lot more about this towards the end of this year when the final guidance is issued by the FDA regarding mobile health. All right. And it, it, it should, that, that guidance should specify, you know, what type of entities are going to be regulated. It should specify the uh, level of risk associated with each type of um, mobile health application. Um, and that will in turn define which pathway it goes through um, within the Center for Medical Devices at the FDA. Um, is, it a, is it a 510K? Is it a PMA? Um, so, so that'll be specified. And, and that, in turn, should help give some clarity to the type of, you know, the different types of studies and different levels of sophistication you have to go through based upon the risk that it poses. Um, and so there'll be more insights into that. But, I, you know, you're looking at at least a year um, from the time the, I would say at least a year from the time that the FDA issues guidance to, to, to until the first type of mobile health devices are, are ready, you know, past, past FDA inspection. Right. Yeah, that seems to be a typical life cycle for this stuff. It is. So here we have a question that, uh, you know, you provided a lot of great information without discussing MedArchon. Um, this has been a great education session. But uh, maybe you can discuss it a little bit now in response to this question because um, they are asking, you know, what software do you recommend? And I assume they mean, you know, what sort of solution should we adopt? Um, I'm sure that you, at the top of your list would be MedArchon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably safe to say. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about it um, and give us, you know, some sense of what people could expect. Yeah, so we think we have a very meaningful solution in this space. Um, Data does not persist through our solution. We have a pretty sophisticated architecture. Um, our architecture was developed by the former head of IS security for HCA. Um, so we, we, we think we have a very secure solution. And, and we really pride ourselves on the usability of our solution. So we spent a lot of time with doctors and nurses um, prototyping the product, um, understanding what benefits were meaningful for them. We looked at the clinical literature to really understand the nature of the problems that were out there. Um, try to come up with a solution that enabled um, kind of best practices. So like looking at 
is it a good idea to do curbside consults? What about templates? Are those a good idea? Um, really trying to understand, you know, from, from a actual best clinical practice what the feature should be, understanding from users what the, the workflows were that they wanted it to have, what the, the functionality was that they needed it to have. Um, we think we've done a pretty good job with that. And, and then kind of our, one of our big differentiating points is we, we actually see secure messaging as the means to an end. So we think it's a, a great solution to provide your organization um, to ensure HIPAA compliance. But we think that the real value comes from the data that's going across the solution. Um, and so we have some data mining capabilities that we have built um, and analytic capabilities that we have built. And we're trying to leverage those for a number of different things um, that are really designed to help promote better um, patient quality of care, better patient outcomes, uh, and trying to promote better financial and other performance outcomes for organizations. We've, we've taken our years of experience in the healthcare industry and, and having been you know, on the other side of the table in, in hospitals and clinics. Um, to really understand the perspective of, of what your organizations need, and I've, I've tried to put that together in a solution that allows you to be HIPAA compliant, allows you to give your doctors and nurses what they want around this, um, but then it's also thinking more big picture about, you know, how can this really benefit your organization. Well, thank you for that information, and um, we're going to give people some more information here in just a moment about where they can visit your website and, and learn more about uh, the product that you offer. I think we have time for just one more quick question, um, and this one is about a product I've never heard of. Uh, maybe you can address it. Uh, let's just throw it at you and see what you have to say. They're asking about a product called DocBook yep. and whether you have pros and cons on that. Um. So I've heard of DocBook. You know, there are a number of solutions that are out there. It's actually a growing list of um, solutions that are out there. Um, uh, you know, it, it's hard for me to, I think, objectively comment sure. on other solutions. Um, you know, I, I think that I, I think that the usability is a little bit off there. Um, I think it's it's a decent solution from a security standpoint. I, I don't think it. Um, I, I do think it persists data. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that, so you know, do 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 more thorough vetting there. Um, but I think that there's some, you know, when we look at when we looked at a lot of the products in this space, um, it's interesting. You know, Doc, DocBook is one of the ones that was also developed by people in healthcare, but you have a lot of solutions that were not developed by people in healthcare. In fact, the solutions were intended for the financial services industry, and they're trying to make it work in healthcare now. Um, so, you know, you have to you have to look at the usability around these things. That's what we encourage people to do. Um, see how thoughtful the different companies are about why they've done things. Are they, you know, just simply copying what, what other vendors have done, or are they thinking through it? Um, get your providers to actually look at it. Do 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 pilots. Do betas with different products, um, and and see kind of which one you your organization ultimately lands on. Um, that finds the most meaning. Well, that's excellent advice, and I, I would add, of course, that people should review this webinar. Uh, you know, we're going to send out the video version of it and the slides, and, and really, I think you've provided great guidance for what are the questions people need to ask as they're looking at this stuff, because there's a lot more complexity than people may expect at first. So you've that's, given people yeah. excellent guidance on how to sort of think through what they need out of the solution and what it should be able to provide. And, and I think that's absolutely right. I, I, we think these questions are meaningful. Um, you know, I'm sure that other vendors would tell you that there are other questions that are meaningful. Um, but from our experience and, and our interactions with CIOs, CMIOs, doctors, nurses, um, we, we think these are the really meaningful questions that, that you should ask um, to, to come to a solution that's going to meet your needs and really help you as an organization um, you know, thrive. Well, uh, I, as I was saying before, we're going to go ahead and take these questions and send them to Baxter and have him provide written answers to folks. Um, if we didn't get to your question, look for that written answer, which we'll deliver via email later in the week, week and we also post that to our website. Um, I want to thank you, Baxter, for joining us today. Uh, it was my pleasure. I really enjoyed this. and. Uh, 
you know, it's, it's a really timely topic. Yeah, it, it certainly is. And I thought, uh, again, that it was a lot of great information for people who are looking at these solutions. Um, again, to learn more about our industry expert, Baxter Webb and MedArcon, please visit www.medarcon.com. You can see the URL on your screen there. Um, and someone just asked if this was recorded. Again, we will be sending out a follow-up email uh, that will have uh, links to both the recorded and PDF versions of this event. Those will be sent out by email, but we also post those to our website. So if you're ever on our website, you can click on the Learning Lunch button, and you can see all of our previous webinars, video versions, um, and you can get the slides as well. I'd like to thank all of our attendees. Uh, again, you can see the recorded and PDF versions of this session on our website. You can visit www.formatapproved.com slash education slash courses underscore security dot html. I know that's a mouthful, but you can see the link there on your screen. Visit that link to learn more about Format Approved's HIPAA, HIPAA training. Our certified HIPAA security professional, or CHSP course, sets the gold standard for security officer training around HIPAA. With the September 23rd deadline for business associate compliance fast approaching, the time to take action is now. That course, as well as providing all the training you need for the designated security officer, also includes business associate agreements. And so if your business associate agreements haven't been updated to comply with the omnibus final rule, that's certainly a nice value add. So go to that link, and you can see all of our other security offerings as well. Visit formatapproved.com to learn more about our upcoming learning lunches. As I mentioned before, the Learning Lunch button there will take you to our entire slate of upcoming webinars and will also let you access our previous webinars. Our next Learning Lunch will air on September 17th and will cover the subject of documentation requirements for ICD-10. Keep an eye on your email on our homepage for other upcoming topics. And thank you again for joining us today.